All right, now I'm recording too. Okay, well, um, thank you for coming. We'll see if more people will uh, fill in as it goes on. Natalie said she may come a little late, but um, we'll see who else joins us. And uh, Charles, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you're there, if you can hear us, but it says your camera and mic is off. So um, I assume you can hear and see me. Hopefully that can uh, work for you in a minute. He was in a long time ago already and uh, went uh, mute. So and he wrote, writes in the chat, he will be a few minutes late, so he might not hear you. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so uh, I'll just start explaining kind of what I had in mind and Paul and I talked a little bit about it uh, yesterday, um, but we didn't get anyone to, to schedule a one versus one debate. And my initial suspicion was that it could be that it may be hard to do that on a weekly basis every, every week. And so the other option was to do a presentation which someone would lead. And I know uh, Paul and Heidi and, and I got a few other emails. Charles emailed me privately about uh, ideas, of what that could be like. Um, and then we could all kind of cross fire and, and ap after uh, the presentation was over. So this idea was more of a, there's no presentation. It's not a one-on-one, -on -one, but it's a, controversial kind of topic that everyone will have a, probably have a slightly different opinion on. And the, there is a, a goal for the conversation. And the goal is to move towards an integral, integrated perspective on the issue and to try to have some integral clarification around it and to try to just bring some sanity to the, to the conversation. And I think for us, it'll be a journey of, in, in the process, it's a journey of trying to understand other people's perspectives if they were different and trying to kind of see the underlying value or concern that's present. And then in an hour and a half, hopefully we'll move towards a convergent perspective in which everyone's um, concerns are adequately integrated and, and filled out into the whole picture. So hopefully having a very clear goal and direction um, laid out, it will help us focusing the shares and help people to give a focus to what, um, is being said. Uh, anyone want to add anything? Paul, do you want to add anything? Um, uh, no, I'm, I'm just kind of excited. And also I appreciate the, the thing you're talking about of kind of conversions. I was, um, um, it just seems like a simple, a simple but effective thing. And I think like I can feel a little bit of almost like fear or aversion around the topic. And I think that has to do with the sheer amount of like, in your email, you said uh, gender wars. And um, to me, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what's going on in the uh, in the culture. So to sort of um, get to some conversion sounds sounds just the ticket. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that you know, recording this and then sharing it. I mean, I think there's there we can really get a lot of wisdom and clarity on these controversial topics and and show people how to talk about them with equanimity and wisdom and and in a very civil kind of way. So I'm. Uh, excited to begin discussion and uh, I know Charles isn't here yet but I know this is something that Heidi has uh, a lot to say about and, and when I was interviewing you I we, t we touched on these things briefly but not as deep as I would like so this is a chance to kind of revisit it so I can more thoroughly hear your uh, perspective on this and Paul I know that you have um, some things to say about it too especially with your exchange on uh, with uh, Corey and the other dude on um, the forum on the men's rights I think it was Mm -hmm, yeah. So, and so I kind of wanted to hear kind of what your take on that was too, and especially how you may have, you may have disagreed a little bit with Corey and um, the other guy, I can't remember his name. Yeah, yeah, I'd be up for that. Great. So, okay, um, let me first understand gender war. You mean in society, or do you want our personal experience, or how, how do you how do you want to um, to go for that? Do, is it sort of hypothetical, or do we uh, talk about what we understand by it? Uh, it could be it could be either one. Maybe we could start with the latter. Yeah, just whatever whatever is most um, the opening can be whatever is most pressing for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how long Charles, it'll take for Charles to come back. So if anyone wants to begin, yeah, go ahead. Um, 
Um, yeah. um, I think for me, like I can feel it in my nervous system, the sheer amount of like conflict I think I've experienced around this subject. Like um, I used to be quite into men's rights and like reading, for example, the, the myth of male power by, by Warren Fowler was a, was a big deal. And um, I think I saw this whole blind spot in culture and all this kind of stuff. And um, recently I got on this men's call with um, Paul Elam, who runs A Voice for Men, basically the biggest sort of men's website. And there was part of me that um, I enjoyed it. And then there was part of me that I had to pull myself away. Like it really seemed quite um, nihilistic and kind of out of context, like like um, not particularly accurate. And I think I've sort of struggled since, like it's a topic that I care quite a bit about, but I've had very few conversations with people of seeing both sides, um, which I think is needed. And also I think I have a little bit of bias towards the men's side of it. My take is basically that I think there are issues on both sides of the tide, but my stance is that kind of culturally and sort of power power wise in institutions in some respects um feminism has a lot bigger sanctioned voice than men's rights which doesn't even really have a word masculism i don't know i don't know what that would be um so it's kind of hard for me to to me to juggle because i feel like at times i want wanting to defend the male side of it but actually i kind of want to be i want to be integral i want to um, embrace embrace both sides and also I think not just out of a point of balance but I think that just the gender debate or the gender issue makes a lot more sense in relationship to each to each other um, the, like men and women affect each other so talking about one versus the other seems to me to end up in in war and kind of a little bit of like victimhood rather than something sort of more rigorous and inclusive that actually like um, the male and female gender role are very are very linked as are men and men and women's relationships. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my I think my general stance. Paul, could you explain a little bit better what you were enjoying in this conversation and where you couldn't? I mean, uh, as an example, so that I know what you what you mean, what what you are. Uh, perception is about what was going on in this call um, the voice for men one I mean it was quite a it was quite a good container for hearing men's side of it and men's suffering um, and also like a container where masculinity was not being shamed that people were fostering um, I would say two things like one is permission to break the male role model the, the male role um, to not have to be forced to do it. And then also um, to talk about suffering, basically, um, that they'd experienced or what they see in the culture. But the negativity to me was kind of like, um, I don't know, seeing the issue like in a very primal way, especially viewing women that way and kind of like, um, kind of a bit too blaming of women or too generalizing, generalizing and stereotyping of women. And ultimately, in my view, kind of, it was too negative and unrealistic. And can you tell me a little bit about the suffering, what they expressed? I mean, I never was in a men's group, so I really don't know. <laughs> um, I think some of it was specific. Like there was a fair amount of losing children in custody cases, mm -hmm. paying um, massive divorce fees or alimony and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was also like a generic suffering of like the world doesn't give a shit about men um, was the general vibe, like watching men's rights be often treated as a hate group um, or people kind of men waking up to the fact that at times there's a lack of empathy was, was definitely like a general, uh, general theme on the calls. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sorry that I asked more. I, what are men's rights? Um, I guess just advocating for um, imbalances in society. So I wish I, I sort of noticed that, like I really want to be integrating more of my orange, but my memory's not always the greatest. But like 
Um, domestic violence, for example, there's hardly any shelters for men. And actually, I wish I knew what the exact statistics were, but it's a lot more close to sort of 50-50 than I think than the stereotypical culture would um, have you believe. Um, custody cases is a big one. Um, I think it's something like 90% of the custody generally goes to, to mothers. Um, there's stuff, I'm not sure if you class it as rights, but there are various kind of like problems in the world. Like for example, um, young boys being put on Ritalin and overly diagnosed for ADHD and all this kind of stuff. And men's uh, or, or boys' grades gradually um, uh, decreasing um, and arguments that the education system kind of biases um, girls' way of, um, uh, way of thinking and, and acting and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there are sort of various issues like um, men commit suicide a lot more, um, workplace deaths is something like 90% or something higher. Um, there's a sort of generalized thing of like male disposability that they have to yeah. provide or protect. Okay, but it's not a right fighting for rights that they need to fight for any right. Like women had to fight for the right to vote, for instance, you know. So when you talk about men's rights, that's not something legal in the sense, except uh, when you say about the ch child care or things like that. Is it that? Um, I mean, I think there are some. I think like conscription, um, like unless I'm mistaken in America, isn't it? You kind of have to, I know it's a bit hypothetical. There's something about like in order to vote, you have to hypothetically um, almost sign on like to a hypothetical, I might, I might be screwed. This is a bit what I mean about the lack of, of orange, but in like various countries in the world, like men have to fight essentially. Yeah, but not, uh, is it in America still duty that you go to the army? In Germany, it's not. I don't know how, not even in Italy, that you have to join the army. I don't know how it is in America. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm, this is why I wish I was better on the facts. Um, I think at times alimony payment is probably an interesting one, like having to pay for children, um, even to the point of like men at times going into prison um, for not doing that. Um, yeah, I mean. Which doesn't create the money the women need, no? When the man is in prison, that's absurd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's, um, I guess, I guess it'd be interesting to debate about whether there's an actual rights or whether there's a sort of imbalance of power or like a uh, not being not being advocated for. Like I'm actually looking at um, have quite a good list on their website for sort of like various issues. Um, so it might be more it might be more in the sense of like more about power and. Um, Re receiving support than rights. Although I think if I thought long enough, I could probably mm -hmm. um, think of stuff with rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it was only for clarification because I wanted to understand what that means. So, okay, thank you. I think part of that is because it's not really a word for um, like a catch or like men's rights or MRA, which is the same, or men's rights acts like it all. There isn't the kind of feminism word for whatever reason. For, for men? I don't know. So, so uh, Heidi, you, you just received some new information about the yes. men's rights uh, world. Well, yeah. what, is your, uh, what is your reaction to that? My response is that in some way, I, I begin from the, from the back end. In some way, for me, it's the, some, the natural but unfortunate backlash, which is happening. Because for me, the, um, the pendulum, you know, the, the evolution goes like this, and then maybe slowly goes into the line. And before it was for hundreds of years, the opposite, you know, that the women had no right, or when they uh, wanted to leave the, the, the family that was or impossible, or they had the children leave, left the children behind. And so it's now an unfortunate reverse, let's say, of the power structure in many ways. Not everywhere. There are still many 
I think, many areas in which the men have the power. But where women can get the power, they try to exercise it in definitely not a better way than the men did before. So, um, but in some way, I want to see it as normalized because that's normally, you know, when one's pushing, then the other are pushing back. And that's how humans do things. And I imagine when we were a little bit more conscious about these things generally, also in culture, but first personally, it wouldn't need to be to this to come to these extremes as they seem to come now. You know, we would be a little bit more sensitive about the impact which we're having. On the other side, you know, who has been a victim for a long time is now happy to, <laughs> to pay it back. So, you know, that's so human normal. I don't approve it, but I think it's just the way it goes. And so I invite you men to, to be one way patient. On the other side, really express what is for you and come out and talk about it. For instance, the feeling of being victimized, the feeling, what does it make with you when, when you are treated in this way? And not go back on, on rights or claims or something, but really share, you know, and make, because we women pretend to be compassionate, you know, but in this case, obviously we are not. So in some way, remind us to, to, to come back to our uh, natural qualities and, and, don't fight. Don't. That is for me. I think Ryan. I talked with you. It's for me. It's another example how women, in not knowing how to do things, they try to do it in the masculine way. And the masculine way was fighting against, and they are still doing it. And I don't think that's the right way to do it. So, you know, both have understanding, but at the same time stand up in a non-violent way and say how things are and how you want to be treated and how you want to be seen and respected, respected, respected. I think this is the word which women for the, for the experience they had for hundreds of years often lost the respect of, of men, especially when they were confronted with physical violence. Then, you know, these things uh, make you lose respect for the others and they are always at the same time women and couples who have deep respect for for each other and for, in all times it has been you know so you cannot say the women or the men it's it's more individual but i do believe that culturally it has some you know some more going more in one direction or in the other yeah i leave it with that I just want to take a moment and um, welcome Charles. And uh, so just, just, I don't know how, if you're listening to any of that, Charles, if when your uh, um, camera was off, but basically we're just having a little discussion about some of the, um, now I guess they're calling, you know, men's rights and also feminism and how we, we may have some divergent perspectives on the issue. And so um, kind of like, what are your two cents on the topic and, and um, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the men's rights uh, movement, Charles. And then also, um, I forgot to say at the beginning, we'll keep our shares to about two and a half to three minutes. So we make sure everyone has a chance, then people can ask follow-up questions like Heidi to Paul, so people can talk more. Well, hey, good morning, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry, I'm a little late. I borrowed some items for the, uh, from my local library last uh, night. I had to give a presentation on the integral theory. I had to return those items this morning. So here I am a little late. Uh, no, I haven't heard anything of the conversation. Um, two cents worth might be what I have to offer today. But um, let me start off by asking Heidi, don't you think women still have to, to fight uh, for uh, the things they want? including equal pay in some, uh, certainly in some sectors of uh, business and employment. Um, uh, not physically fight, of course, but continue to put pressure on the establishment. W wouldn't you think so? 
I do think in, in certain areas they have to, but when they are now so fighting against men, let's say, that's what I mean, not, not fight in, uh, <laughs> against men as such, that they fight for equal payment when they do the same things or more or less the same things. That's, that's okay, you know, but I, I wouldn't even call that fight because what I see what women do, they have less confidence in asking for the right payment. You know, they have less confidence and being, uh, and I had it in my life for sure. I didn't ask and, and for, for, you know, for getting better paid better or I was we, we have this thing they they should see that we are good and they should give us the right payment something like that you know we have this lack of competitiveness in in our uh, in our DNA let's say you know and so what I think we need we women first need to get convinced ourselves that what we do is valid and then find a way to present it and to say, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this and this is valid and here, pay me. Otherwise I go. And we often don't have this courage. So it's, I don't think that it is a bad will because it's not only women. If a man pr presents himself in this way, he gets paid less too, you know? So... <laughs> It depends on your ability to make yourself valued. And that is more, it's not necessarily gender specific, but it, it can be. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it fight. I would call it come into your power, into the right way of your power and present yourself in that way. Right. Were you ever a member of a union, Heidi? The unions, yeah. What if I'm what? what uh, I asked whether you had ever been a, a member of a union, and, no. and if so, um, what do you think is the would be the role of unions in campaigning for uh, women's equality in the workplace and and for for other issues? I don't know. I only know that the unions have lost very much uh, importance in the last decades. They were quite strong, at least I know from Germany in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and since then. And a, a, a women's union, I don't think it ever has existed, and I don't know if, if that makes sense. I, I don't know. Uh, no, probably not. Mm -mm. Now, in, in the United States, union membership has declined drastically over the last oh, almost 100 years now. It's not an accident. Uh, is the, uh, does the same situation exist in Europe? Yeah, I know that when I was still in Germany, the unions were strong and could get uh, increased the uh, life uh, status of, of the workers quite a bit. But it has decreased, I would say, in the last 20, 25 years a lot. They have, yeah, they are still doing something, and, uh, but they have much less result then they are not as strong anymore and not have not as many members anymore as they have before. Right. Now the unions have, have always, uh, as far as I can tell, I was a member of the teachers union here in British Columbia for many years. Uh, and they have always been organizations that insisted on equality between men and women. And I've worked alongside some, uh, uh, some, a pretty ferocious uh, female battler, I can tell you. So that's one way, one way that women and men are working together uh, to, to achieve certain ends. Uh, but of course, there are, are uh, frictions and, and fights going on between men and women in other areas of the culture. So we need to talk about those too, I guess. I was just thinking um, how some of the debate could be around like personal responsibility versus kind of things outside of it, like institutional stuff or biases. I kind of appreciate how do you bring it back to personal responsibility? Because I think at times I've gotten lost in the kind of like rah, rah, like men are being mistreated or something like this. And then actually seeing that there is a fair amount of 
choice. And also at times like, um, for example, on the, on the men's side of it with the work would probably be something like workplace deaths that men are generally the ones that do the really dangerous jobs and all this kind of stuff. But kind of ironically bringing women into the workforce seemed to have just naturally uh, made it more safe. Um, even though that wasn't a direct goal, I think partly because of like women's strength or there's, there's a certain like potentially receiving more empathy. Um, I'm just thinking how it's like, even at times, not even thinking directly about helping each other out that it seems to happen to some extent naturally. Like, I'm not sure if it, um, affects it enough men dying in like, they should have more safety regulations in this kind of stuff. But I think there has been a fair amount of Warren Fowler talked about this, about bringing women into the workforce actually made the, the sort of office environment a lot more safe. I can imagine that really, because we have more of this, not everybody, but generally more of this taking care for the future, being aware of dangers. And I see it in, in my relationships, the men with whom I was, I mean, I'm more neurotic in, in trait, um, neuroticism than most of them. But I was always, you know, when we go on the olive trees to prune, I, I'm taking care, put the ladder in a certain way. And so, and they just ooh, climb up, yeah, and then maybe fall down or something like this. And I said, oh, you could take care before. So I think that is a character, uh, character thing. And so when women are together with men in a workplace, I could very easily understand that they take care that this workplace gets safer. That's, I have never thought about it, but I could imagine, yeah. So, so Paul, so what you just said was really interesting because um, I don't know who you said pointed out that having more women in the workforce made it safer for men. So wouldn't that mean that the men's rights movement would be, would be pro-feminist in terms of getting women into the workforce or into certain sectors? Yeah, I think I had to catch myself there because I'm not actually sure that it, it has massively affected uh, men. Um, I'd be interested in like studies of that. I think the problem is, for example, like say you work on an oil rig, which is really dangerous, like people die regularly. You generally don't get many women there. Um, so it's sort of like in a way having both, uh, both kinds of sexism um, it sure shows you how it kind of like affects both because maybe there are women who would actually like to work on an oil rig. I mean, there are some women that are crazy enough to want to work on the front lines of military, but you have to be um, kind of a risk taker to go into these jobs. So I can see it in a scenario where it's like, for example, the oil rig, maybe there's sexism against women, so less women go there, but also there's probably sexism towards men in the sense of like, oh, you're more disposable. Um, or maybe there, there's kind of like financial pressure to do this kind of stuff. So I think like, I find it useful to try to see both sides of it in all the scenarios, if that makes sense. I wouldn't call this sexism at all. As a, two, two things I want to say. Women are calling for equal rights and equal representation in certain places of society. We don't want to really work on the street and put tar on or bricklayers or building houses. I'm so happy with the heavy work here on my, in my ground if I have a man to do that. I did it until five years ago, but I don't want to do it anymore. So that's the other point. We women, when you said there are women crazy enough to do certain things, that's because we want to demonstrate that we can do it like men. And for me, I did it a long time in my life. I, I, I put tiles everywhere and I, 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 the half house I built, you know, and all this strong stuff when I was still stronger or more willing to be a man. Uh, but it's not that we really want to do it. We want to show up as if we are as strong and as valid as men. And this for me is the wrong approach. And I have to say it after many decades, I did that. So <laughs> it's not choice. And I doubt if any woman wants to do that or work on an oil thing. <laughs> yeah, I think, to me, I think it's both. Like, I think, for example, they did a lot of research on STEM and they, there was a lot of feminist rhetoric saying that STEM was sexist because there weren't enough women engineers and all this kind of stuff. And they later found out that 
if you had a woman with the same qualifications and a man with the same qualifications, the woman was actually more likely to get employed for whatever reason. Maybe that was like a sort of counteraction of, of like culture. But I think these things are like, I think they're half natural and half uh, some sort of, maybe sexism has a kind of like certain connotation around it, but like cultural conditioning around it. So I don't think you'd ever get as many women working on the front lines or as on the, the oil rig or whatever. Um, but then also possibly some of the culture may exaggerate that even more. And then at other times, maybe you get the opposite. Like you get, uh, I think you're right, Heidi, of feminism having this kind of thing of like, okay, women need to do what men do. So it's almost doing that just to prove that they can do it rather than an actual one. Like one of the things Jordan Pearson talks about is the fact that it's this paradox of the more egalitarian a culture gets, the more difference there is actually between the jobs that men and women do, because when you don't have as much money in middle class, you basically do whatever you can to survive. Um, and when you actually have more men and women seem to actually become more divergent in what they choose. Yeah. And the fact, for instance, in India, where there are so many women in, in uh, IT, no, that's the only way for them to, to get, to get out you know, and took it. And, but I don't think that I, I heard uh, an interview with someone that they really want to do it, but that's a way to, to get into the workforce and to get into contact with others. Go ahead, Charles. You're muted, Charles. Charles, John, you're uh... Uh, I thought that struggle of women to um, be allowed entry to uh, certain types of jobs and professions was pretty well over. Um, I have a niece who was a smoke jumper in New Mexico, I think. And I know of uh, other women who have done uh, jobs traditionally were uh, taken up by men truck driver for a heavy truck driving. Uh, women work for the, uh, for the park service. Uh, and for um, and for uh, fire stations, so they're firefighters, they're police. So, but I I think within those those professions, my impression is they're still battling to be treated with respect. For example, I heard a story recently that uh, a woman who worked for the Forestry Service, the uh, United States Forest Service, in Washington State had to file official complaints about sexual harassment. And she said she wasn't the only one. And that battle is still going on in the military as well. So this is cultural rather than structural, isn't it, with respect to women's treatment in the workplace? It's funny as well, because there's always like one, two sides of it, it seems to me, to every story. like one of the things that some of the men's rights community has beef with is a little bit is some of the sexual harassment, some of the um, legal shifts around uh, rape and things like this, like um, in America, like kind of a kangaroo court culture um, in universities. Like I, th I think uh, there's been a fair amount of like one in four um, women in university campuses or something like this is, has been sexually assaulted or raped or something like this. And it's kind of hard to justify that statistic when like, that's higher than like in the Congo where they use rape as a weapon of war. And there's been various kind of talks about like how accurate is uh, rape statistics and all this kind of stuff and the wage gap and all this kind of thing. Um, sorry, I feel like I'm being deliberately divulged. <laughs> uh, no, no, this is, this is good. I, so um, if, if I may, Paul, I just kind of wanted to, to focus this for a second and, and bring up something very controversial for us to chew on. So the two themes that have come up so far, one of them that you had brought up, Paul, was personal responsibility and the both sides kind of perspective. And also Heidi was mentioned talking about like respect or this idea of like dignity or, you know, kind of whether it's your job or attached to your gender identity group. And so one of the things that I've always found, I, I don't really know how to think about a lot of these gender issues because it's not really my forte. Um, is the whole sexual harassment thing. And some, some uh, the more conservative approach from what I've seen is kind of like 
saying that if you're a woman and you dress in a certain way and put on makeup or whatever, you dressed provocatively or, you know, you were kind of asking for it. Like, like it's kind of your fault. And this kind of intersects with like the whole Me Too discussion. And so like, when it comes to these cases, what is a nuanced way to think about them in terms of a both sides and personal responsibility? And uh, uh, yeah, am I, am I accurate in sizing up that problem? Yeah, I feel like, I feel like for example, rape cases are probably the greatest example of that, where it's a really hot topic. And um, it feels taboo to actually point out that it is actually, from what I understand, it is a two, two side thing. Actually, it's really hard to tell whether someone was raped or whether they weren't. Um, and it's almost like, it's very, it's very hard to get around that. Like I think of certain things like, I think rape victims generally should be supported um, as much as they can do. Not so much what feminists say. I've heard some of these lines like, believe women um, is something that flies in the face of the law. But I, I can understand the emphasis of like support and all this kind of stuff. And um, I feel like false rape allegations is a big taboo in the culture. But that, that very topic is a perfect example, I think, of what you were saying, Ryan, of like the two sides of all these things. I think this is always the, the, the two sides in it. I think it has always been a way of power from both sides. The power of women is to accuse somebody of rape when, when it hasn't happened. And the power of men <coughs> to, to rape a woman because he is normally stronger than, than a woman. Not always, but normally. And then uh, uh, deny it. And then in the past has always been that the woman has not be believed because it's difficult if there was nobody with a video camera nearby, it's difficult to, to give um, uh, evidence that it really has happened. And so I'm not wondering that um, it's, go like I said before, it's going in the opposite direction now in a complete exaggeration of what they call what rape is. And uh, we know what rape is when it's really, I mean, the extreme. What, and you said, you know, you said in Congo is a uh, uh, rape uh, instrument of war. It's not only in Congo. That's everywhere. Everywhere. You know, it was in the Second World War and it's uh, wherever you go. That is an old, ancient, innate uh, dominance thing. Uh, when you can humiliate and other people the best when you be in power of their women and when you humiliate the, the women and so you humiliate also the men of the, of the tribe uh, or the, the people. And that is very, very, very ancient, very primitive. This is, uh, I don't know, beige or something, beige and red and, and you know. So that it is uh, still in Western culture, as you see, when they fall back into these levels, that's, that's normal. And I don't know what has been in Vietnam. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody will tell you, you know. So it's, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. And I do think when women, uh, young girls go with mini shirt around uh, and, um, and, and, you know, dressed up sexy like this, uh, along a, uh, a quarter of a city where people from other countries and other cu cultures live, where in their eyes, this is a woman to, you know, to, to get, it's a whore, then that's also the responsibility of the woman. When she is in the right uh, surrounding, you can, she can do what she wants, but she has to, to, in my opinion, be aware where she is behaving in a certain way, in a, in a sexual prov provocant way. And often we want to do that. We want to be, you know, we want to be seen. We want to be qu courted, you say. We want to be uh, asked, you know. And more often than not, if it doesn't work out, then we are even disappointed. So, you know, it, it's, it's not so easy. <laughs> Do you think that the people who criticize women who dress provocatively have something of a point? Like I know the, 
the uh, uh, feminists say a woman should have the right to wear whatever she wants. And of course that's true. And if men were mature, it wouldn't bother them. Uh, I mean, most men do not uh, approach women inappropriately and harass them simply because they're dressed in a sexy manner. That's most men, but a lot of men do. And it's considered a cultural and social problem. So do you think the, the people that say, look, if a woman dressed more modestly, she, she might have not have so much risk. Do you think they have something of a point? First of all, I want to say the fact that men are not falling over every woman they get and who is dressed provocatively is a great achievement of human development and of, of male development also, that you can um, control your biological instinct. That's, for me, it's a level of development, for sure, at least blue, you know. And the others who are not there, they have a difficulty with that. And when it is like a hunter, when he sees the prey, hunting, if it is unconscious. So, that, as I said, yes, they have a point. Uh, a woman can dress what she wants when she is sure she, that there is not uh, arousing a negative uh, effect for herself. She needs to also take care of her safety. You know, and when we are in a civilized uh, society where you can be sure that the men are civilized, she can do what she wants and enjoy it, you know, and the men enjoy it too as, a, as beauty or something, you know, and don't feel that they now have to assault her. But when it's in the wrong em environment, she better doesn't. I, I think for me, that there's a thing about, I think there needs to be like nuance about the amount of responsibility. Because I think there's absolutely, and I think that's what people get a little bit confused about. It's kind of like to blame a woman because she um, she dresses sexily or something like this. It feels a little bit like, oh, I can't, that seems a bit much, probably because um, it is. Like, I think even if a woman goes out and she just acts like a total whore, she gets shit faced and like sling herself around. If a guy then rapes her, like, I don't see her as having as anywhere near as much responsibility as him. But she's still, she is responsible. I mean, if you act, and I think that's the kind of thing, it's like degrees of, like, kind of acting. For example, like, I think rape gets, at times, like, very nuanced. Like, if you're inviting a guy, maybe, but you don't realize that he's a maniac, so you may be, like, sexually open to something, but then not sexually open to, like, all this, this other stuff. Um, so I think there's kind of, like, a fair amount of... Um, nuance to the responsibility. Like my personal take is say you're around a bunch of sort of third world kind of men so, and it's, a, a, it's more savage. Like you definitely should be more, you should definitely consider your safety. But, you, but I don't know actually, maybe that's an interesting point of debate. Are you equally responsible or is it um, like, should you be more aware that they're dangerous or should they be more, should they be less dangerous themselves? For example. Uh, who who should be less dangerous it, themselves, men or women? Uh, the the men. So in in reference to like they're around a bunch of guys that would um, want to be a bit politically incorrect, but just <laughs> the kind of typical dudes that might be a lot more like red and savage. Like, should you know? I I kind of feel like you. To me, probably not. Actually, you're still responsible, yep. but not as much as the. You know, in these cases, you cannot ask the other one to do as you like them to do. You have to take care for yourself. I was thinking about, uh, did, do you know a very old film from the 20s or something, or 30s, The Blue Angel? That was about a woman, uh, I think Greta Garbo was uh, playing it. And she, she really ruined a, 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 a respectable man with her attractiveness. And he fell into... There is the song, I think, about it, he, like the moths uh, who come to the candle, you know. She, she really attracted him 
and had him in, in his grip and he was completely then socially ruined and I, I don't know. It was, it's a beautiful film anyway of the beginning of last century. Um, you know, we also need to know what, what intention we have as women. And, and the men also on the other side need to know if they fall into the trap or not. And sometimes it can be harmful for the woman and sometimes it can be harmful for, for the man. And the only, for me, inequality is in the physical power. And uh, because when it comes to the real physical uh, overwhelming uh, whatever uh, grip, then it's often too late to, to get out. But, but women, if they are sensible enough, they can know and not provoke, pro, provoke up to the point or into it that they better go at the right moment, you know? That is very, very nuanced. We cannot say it's only the man, it's only the woman, or half and half. It's, 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 it's a game. And up to a certain point between the genders, we want to play the game. But we need to, to know when it becomes dangerous, both sides. Sounds like wisdom to me. I, for a long time, believed that women have just as much power in relationships as men do. It's just different. I would even power, say... Power of seduction is one of them. And you just talked about that, Heidi. Yeah. This is our power. The power to, to manipulate men and to get them do what we want them to do. That's very old power in which I think when we are in the feminist uh, movement or feminine women's development, we need to give up this power. And we need to be uh, sincere about that and become more honest and more, uh, what do you say? Yeah, not manipulative. That is the old power we had. Men had the physical power and you begin to renounce on it, you know, as educated men. But women, I see it very often, are still not renouncing on their manipulative uh, power. And that's, I find, really not good. There was something there was something you said earlier, Heidi, and I kind of had a little bit of, like, um, went to bait, which is uh, feminists often propose the same thing as well, that basically, like, some of the things that are happening now are a result of the, the pendulum swinging. Um, so men have basically been in power forever, and then women get the right to vote and all this kind of stuff. And now it's an imbalance of, um, it's swinging too far, but um, I think a fair amount of what, the, what gets said in the men's, in men's world is that it's never been like that. Um, or at least it's not as black and white as feminists um, would have would, the, the typical line. And it's kind of always made me wonder about, um, like, can women really own their, their power if the entirety of history is painted in this brush as women were basically victims for most of history? And I think, um, I think there's plenty that you could advocate that actually women had plenty of power to an extent. Or, for example, if men are disposable, if they're the ones that can go off and fight or have to work at their own risk, and women um, don't get as much respect Taking care, of, taking care of children, but they're also more safe. Is a um, th that just seems like a big, a big thing for me culturally that doesn't doesn't seem to get pointed out. I do think that women had a lot of power, but a different power, and not in 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 many places which they would have liked to have power. You know, as soon as a woman f fell out of society, then power was not there anymore. But as soon as they were inside society. They had quite a distinct power. And um, yeah, and I don't think there is an, an imbalance. I think it, we were not victims. Come on. Some, some are, yeah, always. As I said, when a woman got pregnant and then thrown out, these are really victims. But when, as soon as you were in society and had a place in society, you were not a victim. Not more than men were. There were many men which could have the same status of victim. You know, in, in feudal societies, the men who worked for the dukes or something, 
they were not not better in 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 a position than women were when they worked in the house for the for the for the family cooking or whatever they did cleaning or, and so on that's no I, I i don't think that you can say that it's the, the women were victims and the men were the, the perpetrators many men were some men were but some many men were also the victims when you want to call them victims but that was the good thing on the blue stage of development that people accepted their life as it was and found some happiness in that. And from our perspective today, we think they were oppressed. Yeah, they were probably up to a certain uh, 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 degree until it came too hard and they had to stand up. But as long as they were in the, let's say in an equalized, uh, no, no, how do I say not equalized, smooth, way of being in the society, men and women had for me the same amount of power, only different power. That's what I think, so out of my... Out of well, my... radical feminists have, have uh, tried to uh, make us believe that men have always oppressed women. I know that that's shit. Yeah, that's... Heidi, uh, as you hinted, that makes women look pretty stupid and weak throughout history. Exactly, exactly, like, like sheep. But, uh, I like this with Ken Wilber when he said, if women had been oppressed all these thousands of years, then they are sheep or something, you know? That's, yeah, yeah. Which, which is not flattering and also not true. If you do a, a lower right quadrant analysis of the historical development of societies, <clears throat> Ken points this out in numerous writings, especially out from Eden, um, and uh, relying on the search of many other people, um, the state of technology in any given era had a lot to determine the roles of the sexes. Back in hunter-gatherer days, the bands uh, had, had to uh, rely on the strength of men to go out and kill game in order to feed their families. But, uh, and, and the women stayed home and looked after the, the kids because it was too dangerous for them to go out. And uh, they lost, uh, well... But while, while they were at home, women looking after the home and hearth, they learned how to, uh, how to raise vegetables in a garden. And this was the horticultural period. And um, when, when humans figured out how to do that, women started to produce more food than men because men would go out and go hunting for, you know, five, six, seven days and get skunk, come back with nothing, uh, only to confront the women have, uh, you know, 15 baskets full of lovely food. Uh, to feed not only a family but the whole village, and and so then, um, women had uh, equal power. It would appear in those kinds of societies uh, because of their productive power in terms of being able to to grow food and feed the families. And uh, researchers have found uh, that that shift in uh, social structure resulted in a shift in the religion as well. So in horticultural societies. Uh, the the gods that they worship tended to be female uh, to a large extent. Well, when when heavy farming was brought in and and the big plow was invented, which had to be pulled by a horse or an ox, women again had to change their roles and become more domestic because they were suffering too many miscarriages trying to uh, you know guide the plow behind a huge animal. So there was a social ag agreement because so many. Uh, miscarriages were being uh, suffered, which was a threat to the growth. Yeah, and, and, and we, don't have, we, don't, we don't have the same amount of physical power, not only the miscarriages. We don't have an, as men, much power than, I mean, strength, force, physical force than men have. Well, that's, that's true. I, I know a lot of women who could handle a, an ox drawn plow a lot better than I could. Uh, and that's been true through my whole life. But, Back in the day, you're probably right. And on average, uh, men are physically more powerful than, uh, than women. This is generally known. So um, the, the uh, relationship between the sexes was worked out cooperatively among them over a period of time in reaction to these technological changes. That seems to me a pretty powerful argument. Now, uh, when a society shifted into the industrial era, um, once, once again, 
uh, women were able to perform many of the same jobs men do because it doesn't take strength to run a sewing machine and work in many other factory situations. So that's when the women's uh, suffrage movement and the women's right, rights movement began uh, in the 19th century. And uh, look, the situation that, that we're in today, we have the uh, so-called informational society. Well, women can operate uh, information technology as, as easily as men can. And in fact, we're told that more women are entering that field, more women are getting university degrees in general, sorry, more women are getting uh, university degrees in general in, in areas like science and math and IT than, than men are. So what do you think of that argument? That, that seems to be pretty strong to me. I think that, that opens something to me, which is, um, I think that's a profound trajectory when you look at the lower right. But I remember watching David Long and he was talking about um, using spiral dynamics uh, in the pickup world. <laughs> that basically like you have this evolution um, between the genders at every single stage. You have that, as you said, Charles, like um, in the lower right. So having a technological shift, but I also think you have, you have a cultural shift. You have a way that like, if you're going to appeal to a red woman, as it were, that's very different than a woman who's a blue or orange or a green. Um, and I think that, that, that doesn't get, that doesn't get stated enough either. That's a good point. I remember somebody said recently, with respect to uh, relationships lasting a long time, if the two partners are at different levels of development, the chances of a long-term life for that relationship are just about nil. Yeah. I wanted to, to um, stress again that up to a certain point, men and women equally uh, had to strive for survival and they they did it in collaboration in a certain level of society in the higher society the women you know that you you might know the the novels by Pronte and these people that in the higher society the the women really were sort of ladies you know you, you could really not do anything and, and um, while the men did the politics or whatever they did. And this mentality, when I came here to Italy, for instance, was still uh, here. So the, the women, uh, married women do the signora. She cleans the house maybe, but she doesn't really have to, to deal with much more. That's all men stuff, you know. And at the same time, in, in Italy up to not long ago, maybe still, is sort of matriarchal. In the, in the house, that's the woman who decides what is going on. Not, it was not so in Germany. In Germany, it was still the, 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 the father who, who had the word, the last word. And here I had the impression that it was still the, 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 the elder lady, was the dominant part of, of the family and uh, had the clan in, in her hand in the inside area, you know, and she, she could also dominate the man in this sense. While the, like mafia things, uh, they were the men doing that. Today I hear that even the mafia uh, ladies are taking the role of the man, which would be in agreement to what we are saying, no? that uh, women try to do the, the man's job. Why before the women were protected and not killed, whatever, when, when, when we talk about mafia and children uh, were not killed and that was the men's job to fight uh, and kill themselves uh, <laughs> among each other. Yeah, and um, I do think it it's, has to do with, uh, with lower lower right uh, in any ways. Society uh, structures, where the power is and um, and also technology the changes which we are facing and it's it's not very long time and i do think what i said at the beginning that we don't know how to do that yet we women exaggerate in many ways because we go out and in the outside and in the inside world world we are not yet ready and the men uh, try to keep the power 
which they had before in the outside world and are not yet ready in the inside world to 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 come to to an equal term i would say equal coming together coming really together and then the whole discussion is on the surface in many ways it's not enough in detail i mean not ours but uh, in society it's black and white and that's not helpful yeah it seems to me that there's a constant back and forth in our dialogue of trying to advocate the position of the male position and the female permission a position like trying to do that equally i find that a lot more satisfying to realize that it's there's always um two sides in every um every sphere there's usually like an intimate like reaction like if men are if men are if, uh, acting a certain way than women are and if women are suffering usually men are suffering as well in but in a, in a very like different way and um i don't know i find it more like a little bit more heartwarming than the typical culture war where it's kind of there's so much of this like no no women don't suffer men suffer and, and kind of vice versa it's like um I think not only is it a pain in the ass, but it's also just like, I think missing something really important that men and women are together always, even if they don't like, um, they don't want to admit that or something. Paul, I think you mentioned earlier Warren Farrell. Have you, have you read some of his stuff? Yeah, to me, he's the, he's the best person in the men's rights movement. And unfortunately he doesn't get enough he doesn't get as much popularity as he should do i think possibly because he's seems to me to be quite integral um you know the fact that he was i think i think it wasn't in like three times on the board like of some really high feminist organization i think at times that doesn't go down well in the men's rights world unfortunately where it tends to be a bit like red and all this kind of stuff yeah he's written on, bo on both sides uh, of the issue. Uh, I read his book, The Myth of Male Power. I was quite impressed with that because he backs up his opinions with, with the best research available, statistics and so on. And uh, his recent book is called The Boy Crisis, which I haven't read, but I, uh, I was able to catch an interview between Farrell and Ken Wilber. It's on the Integral Life website, very intelligent conversation, as you can imagine. Um, the theme of, of The Boy Crisis is that uh, too little attention is being paid to the plight of today's generation of teenage boys, especially teenage boys. Of course, the roots go back earlier. Um, they are, uh, this is a generation uh, of boys which is confronted by a massive identity crisis. I mean, it's hard enough to be a teenager if, if things are good, you know, like back in the 50s when I grew up. But today, uh, one, one looks around in vain for decent role models, and uh, Farrell uses statistics to argue that the main problem is the boys don't have role models at home. Their fathers aren't home. The fathers are either out working, doing what traditional dads always did, and that is uh, be the breadwinner, um, or they're uh, divorced and they're, and they're off doing their own thing. Uh, Farrell thinks that this is a terrible crisis for culture, and uh, I think Jordan Peterson is drawing attention it, to it as well. So this would be another issue for both men and women to be extremely concerned about. Yeah, I, I, I really like, um, I haven't read Myth of Male Power, but I've heard, oh, sorry, um, The Boy Crisis, but I've seen him in a fair amount of interviews and there's something I think that really brings it home, which is the importance of fathers in some ways. Um, and like in a really, like really robust way, the amount of prisoners that basically that um, didn't have a father is massive. Like I found it quite heartwarming to have it advocated the amount that fathers do and not, not just for young boys, to be fair, um, they do generally. And it's kind of, um, um, yeah, it, it did make me think like, when you were saying being a teenager and growing up, it actually made me think a little bit of my experience where um, there's part of me a kind of sadness because um, I think as I grew up, there was already a lot of green bashing of masculinity. And frankly, like, I don't know if I'm 
so having rose tinted glasses for a, a bygone era, but um, it took me becoming a lot older to actually like even come across like a feminine woman. Cause it sort of seemed like there was already a lot of pressure for women not to be feminine, which is a wonderful irony of, um, of feminism. Well, I guess I'm sort of rambling a little bit there, but also like, I think I think young girls are seem to be faring a lot better than young boys. But maybe there's also a bit of uh, damage being done on that on there as well. I think the missing fathers have have been missing a long time, and not only now. They were in 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 the workplace, and they were rarely at home. But at least they were present. And today, it seems to be that many women think they don't need a father for, for growing their children. And I think this is really not a good thing. As we were talking before, of uh, they want the money, yes, and the father should pay, but they don't allow the father to, to be with the children and take influence uh, on the children. And that's not good, not good at all. So, And we women don't have a role model either how we can be in this time of, uh, of history, let's say. We are trying desperately. And as I said before, we tried uh, to, to become men and we have increased the masculine energy in the world, which is not really going towards a balance. And what my desire is, and with the women I have around me in, yeah, in conversation circles, is to, to find out what what a woman could be today, you know, what, what a role model could, could be, look like for young girls. And they don't... How, how about Hillary Clinton? I know. No, thank you. Or, or Theresa May or somebody. I mean, no, that's, that's still the, the masculine uh, drive. That she is, they both, these, these women high in politics, they, they came there because they adopted the male model. <coughs> they have no feminine way of doing this. And the, the real enigma and the research is how can women do things differently, but at the same time effectively, but not in the effective, in the orange way necessarily, but in a different way effectively. And this is, is a real a quest which we are trying to, at least some of us are trying to, to, to take on. And um, yeah, not easy because we, we don't know. <laughs> and you men, you don't know either, you know. So we better work together <laughs> in some way. Yeah, I don't know. I can't even imagine. I mean, as long as, as say, politics and corporations are organized, um, uh, along the lines of a, of a dominator top-down hierarchy, um, what other way is there to uh, climb up that ladder of success except to use the qualities of the sort of mythic uh, traditional guy? Be really assertive, competitive, sometimes ruthless, uh, take no prisoners, wear pantsuits. Uh, there, is there another way for women to be in, the, in that kind of a structure? I can't even imagine it. Uh, I do think there could be, and there are experiments with that, you know, uh, uh, when it must not necessarily be a woman be on top of a new way of, of, of enterprise, as Frederick Laloux, as Ryan knows, no? uh, he has seen several uh, businesses and the tier movement. There they are people trying to organize organizations in a different way. And um, the, the, the challenge would be for women create um, organizations in that different way and being confident enough that they can do it and not fall back into this orange hierarchy thing. Because often women, when they go into the masculine way, they are worse than men in, in their ways of behaving because it's not their, their natural way. And so they have to really split from their feeling. And so they have no contact with their feeling component. And so they can do horrendous things. Why men, this is also statistic. I've, maybe even in Warren Ferry, I don't know where I read that, that men 
uh, would stop in a certain position where these women who are, have been so muscul masculinized, they would go ahead. So, because they are just separated from their natural uh, being. Why men, men have a heart after all. <laughs> yeah, somewhere. Somewhere, yeah. And we don't have it anymore when we have separated from it, you know, to, to climb the ladder of, of, a, of, an, of a paradigm which is not um, respecting our natural ways of being. So we, we just erased it and then whatever can happen, happens. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, uh, Frederick Dodu a couple of minutes ago. I read his book. I think it's called The Enlightened Organization. And uh, he researched uh, at least a dozen, maybe more, uh, business organizations and public service organizations that have organized themselves um, in a completely non-hierarchical way. Uh, the way they've, they've managed to pull it off is, is astounding. I've told friends about it and they said, that can't be real, that, that can't exist. You cannot have a leaderless organization. It won't work, it won't make any money. Well, the fact is, that sort of organization is proliferating around the world. Um, and this would be a natural way for women to go if researchers like Carol Gilligan are right that uh, women uh, in general tend to be more relational and caring and, and more concerned about people because that's a guiding principle of those kinds of non-hierarchical organizations. We are so more collaborative also. We love collaboration and working hand in hand, as we say. You know, mm. everybody knows what they need to do in the, in the right moment without somebody telling you, you have to do that. <laughs> and the, the principle is also that you discover what you like to do best uh, and then you do that, you know, instead of being told what you have to do, which maybe is not your your inclination. So new enterprises need to figure out what where people are good at and want to do it. And then the effectiveness of the, inter, uh, of the um, enterprise is much higher than when you order them, you have to do that. Oh gosh, I don't want to do that. But what can come out of something which you do under pressure? And what can come out if you do something because you feel energized, you feel you want to collaborate and do your part which you are really confident to be doing, to be able to do well. So mm -hmm. and that's more, that's more, yeah, that's more the women principle. Yeah, the female principle to, to really do something out of your heart and out of your desire to do the things, I would say. <laughs> I feel like so sort of beef with that, like, like there needs a little bit of uh, tweaking or something like that. Like I think of, um, I think guys, guys seem plenty, collaborative to me or in touch with their heart but it's like there is something different about the way that women relate and the way that like, there is that stereotype that at times men seem to care more about things and stuff in the world more than more than people but it's sort of um uh, i don't know i'm just reacting just kind of the the idea that women have more heart or more, more caring or something like this i know you're not i know you're not really saying that honey but just sort of kind of hunting around for a definition that feels like it's uh, fair to both genders or something. I do think that uh, men are more uh, loving the competitive game, while women love more the collaborative game. Yeah, I can, I can see some of that in the way that mothers and fathers seem to relate to their children. Like I was, I was saying this with Ryan, like there's a certain pleasure of father of like bringing your child up you know, like they're at one stage and there's a pleasure in like teaching them things and making them uh, improve. And it seems like the feminine is more nurturing of like where they already are, appreciating from for where they already are. Um, I don't know, I sort of, I, I kind of hunger for like a definition that feels sort of caring of both genders, it feels accurate. Um, you know, that's kind of like really, so it actually it reminds me of spiral dynamics. Like it seems like quite a complex thing to to actually define because there's so many ways that men and women are different, and it's quite easy to because we're so connected to like bias one, like over the other, just with a, like a bad um, definition or something. 
I didn't understand the rest, the last uh, two sentences. What did you mean there? Well, if I say something like women are more caring than men, um, or more collaborative or something like, there's a way that even though there's, there's truth to that, but there's a way like that it's lacking detail where it's almost like if one, if the genders aren't defined together in a way that's really fitting, then like somebody loses out. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't say that men are, um, women are more caring than men. I think men care in a different way mm -hmm. than women do. And women compete in a different way. Women compete for the attention of men, for instance, but not so much for getting somewhere in, let's say it's different, the, the competition for status more than for status, how they are seen and, you know, um, than for, for achievement, I would say, in the outside world. That seems to be less interesting. And as you say, men are more interested probably in things and achieving something with the things in the outside world. I think uh, women are more trying to achieve something in the inside world and in, in, in the, in the so society, in the, in, the, in the lower left quadrant in this case. Mm. Heidi, you said that, that you think that uh, men do, do have feelings. If people, people say, well, uh, men don't have feelings or, or not much. When somebody makes an extreme statement like that, you can right away think, well, that's got to be wrong. Um, so if you think that men care, but they care in a different way, what is that different way, do you think? This is not so much like da 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 like we da 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 They are more, first of all, they, they are still ready to, to, to give their money away to the family. Or that's a sort of care. And they really care, but they, they are not so expressing it in this super caring way, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> they express it maybe more in deeds than in, mm. in, in words and in what we normally understand with care, you know. With, so the feelings are there, but the emotional intelligence is deficient. Is that the I way you know put if it? it is, it, maybe it's deficient, I don't know. But the, the expression is differently. I, I don't know where I heard that, but for instance, the way of um, overcoming loss and grief for women is, is, and men can be quite different. Who said that? that uh, oh gosh. Who was it who lost the son? A beetle, or can it be a beetle or a rolling stone? Lost, uh, I think a rolling stone lost the son. And he closed himself for a year and afterwards he had composed two or three wonderful songs. Well, the women probably would go and talk with their friends and talk it through and get compassion and get, you know, uh, they, they would go more in community why probably men to, to, to overcome difficult situations go more into eremit way, into uh, going into themselves and, and closing them away. And we women want to talk it through. And this is for me also a big problem in couples that the expectation how to deal with problems is different on both sides, you know. We, we want to talk and we say, oh, don't you feel it? And why don't you talk with me? And blah, 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 blah. And you want just to be quiet and let, let to be alone, you know? So it's, to well, get well, this understanding is difficult. <laughs> well, you know, you have to remember during the, during the 70s, at least among the educated classes, there was this huge explosion in interest in the emotional life and in, uh, and in men making a, a shift into relating uh, in a better way. So you had organizations like uh, Big Sur in California that had all kinds of experiments and, uh, and experts working on uh, men and women's relationships in, in small groups were working on different kinds of therapy, gestalt and role plays and so on. I went through that whole process myself, did a lot of work in those days. And uh, uh, so that was when I, when I learned the truth that, that men have a feeling side of their lives and uh, it's actually pretty fulfilling to, to express it. So 
uh, that uh, phenomenon has been around for 40 years now. And I would think, again, among the educated classes, that men California. these days, as a rule, don't feel uh, ashamed or shy or, or uh, that it would be unmanly to go talk to somebody because they're going through a grieving process. There are lots of men's support groups. Uh, you've got uh, individual therapy and so on. Um, you, you other guys in the group here, do you, do you think that's the case, that there's much less reluctance on the part of men to express feelings um, in the way that women have uh, these days, that we're more comfortable with it? Um, that's part of me, yeah, definitely. I think, I think that's green influence. I think green, to be fair, has helped everybody to be in, more in touch with their feelings. And um, I think like a lot of green in the early days, it felt quite great. And then now they're kind of a little bit the ass end of it. It seems like men get a little bit sort of weird on the one hand, encouraged to be more emotional on the other hand, kind of slapped around a bit. But it makes me wonder if like, um, my hunch is that on the lower ends of the spiral, there was less emphasis on being like really stoic. The, I always find it ironic that men are sort of told that like, you know, less in touch with their feelings when so many writers and poets and musicians and artists, etc., are men. Um, that it's sort of, it's kind of weird to, to I mean, it's definitely, I, I agree with Heidi. Like I think, um, I remember Warren Farrow talking about this in reference to therapy, that women often prefer to talk to one another. And there is a way that either a guy will go inside of himself and, and do something or there's a way that guys bond without actually speaking like they'll go fishing or build something and um i guess like what i see in green sometimes of like oh yeah men really aren't in touch with their emotions or they're not in touch with their bodies like i often think women have a i don't think women are, women are really in touch with their bodies in a way that's different to women i think women are, tend to be more in the emotions and with the guys it tends to be more like some kind of raw primal kind of thing where the fact that you can go out and do fishing and not actually say anything to one another, just your body language and whatever you're putting your energy to is, um, is just as embodied and kind of meaningful. And they both, and they both really, really matter as well. Um, I think that was a bit of a ramble. <laughs> well, we have about five minutes left for this uh, discussion. And it really seemed like, well, obviously everyone here is a pretty reasonable, <laughs> integrally informed uh, thinker. And so I just wanted to kind of recap some of the things that were kind of the, some of the themes that we've hit on them that I believe that we all agree on. And then we can kind of do like a closing checkout before we're done. And so um, some of the things that were coming up were from the beginning, personal responsibility for, for everyone. Um, looking at both sides of the issue and so not getting trapped into looking at a oh, one one person was victimized and it was the all the other person's fault so kind of a more nuanced look at these things uh different kinds of power you know like kind of against this narrative of men have all the power women have no power and saying well there would, if you have a more nuanced view this depends on what area it's in what kind of power is it lower right quadrant is it lower left quadrant right so like having a more nuanced view of how both sides have a lot of power, you know, power in different areas. And also the differences between the genders and also seeing how both of them have their strengths, but manifest in different ways. And it's very different than just being like, okay, you know, women are wonderful and men are horrible rapists, and murderers. And, and instead being able to see that it's kind of like a pro pro chart, right there. And so that it's kind of like looking at the stages of development where each stage has a benefit and a weakness and they're not, demonize altogether and same thing with the gender differences or it's that each person has each men and women tend to have certain predispositions and that they shouldn't be looked at in terms of good or bad but really looked at in terms of like what are the strengths and unfortunately we didn't get enough uh have enough time for this this time but i kind of wanted to have a discussion maybe people can share this in the closing what does the ideal integral man or woman role model look like 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 maybe everyone can give a two minute summary and, and throw in their two cents on what that would, uh, what would that look like for them? And, and I'll just say for me personally, I think I had an interesting journey of being involved in a lot of female dominated fields and uh, massage school, 
yoga teacher, yoga therapist, babysitting, uh, early childhood education. Uh, these were um, after school care for kids. And some of these, I, I wouldn't even be hired because I was, I was a man. And, um, and I mean, I can understand that, you know, but, or some people don't want to get a massage from a man. Most of the massage therapists who are advertising for like really cheap rates in Portland are all men because no one wants to go get a massage from a man. They don't know. Uh, even if you're a really good massage therapist. Right. So for me, it's like, um, I think I have a lot of more female characteristics. Um, and, and also the, my, my masculinity was mostly developed in like debate, martial arts, intellectual pursuits. So for me, it's like a kind of have a balance of the two and knowing and having both of those strengths at my disposal. So that's, I would say would be my idea of like integrated, uh, masculine, feminine qualities and also, um, what I think the future male or female role model could be. That's pretty darn good, Ryan. We should talk about that. Anytime. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great job you do. That, that's one of the great things that a moderator can do is summarize uh, main points that uh, come up during a conversation. But, but you did more than that. You talked about yourself and, and what an integrated male-female person might be in this, in this modern age. So I think I'm going to take you as my role model. <laughs> and as for a takeaway from this meeting, I'm going to think, got to think more about what uh, Heidi said about men, men's caring. Men, I, I certainly believe men care or capable potentially uh, as caring as women, but they do it in a different way. I'm not clear what that different way is. So that's something to further think about. So thanks for that, Heidi. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the, the convergence on the end uh, from Ryan. I think like there's something about, sorry, I'd have to put my headset in one second. Um, something about being able to rally behind something we would agree on. Um, I think for me, like a perfect integral man or woman would be someone that could like rigorously see the differences between men and women, um, all the different stages of spirals and all the different ways of expressing and being able to see like a nuanced way of that men can be positive and women can be positive and men can be negative and women can be negative and how they're really quite related. Um, it actually seems quite a difficult process to like, how do you define male and female difference um and i think it's kind of i don't know it feels like quite a potent practice because i think in a way it's kind of um i imagine it allows both genders to be more themselves as well as being more integrated like the a, a man is allowed to be more feminine because they can actually appreciate the qualities and, and vice versa um so I, th I, yeah, I think for me, there's something quite integral of like really being able to find all of this kind of stuff and then also being able to, to embody it. Like, um, I know I, I often hunger for more feminine and masculine expressions, um, in the world. And I think some of that will come from having more clarity around, um, why they matter or how they act or, the way they're different. And I think, I think that there's probably something, my, my hunch is that there's probably something really important about the relationship between the two, um, that will, will be increased, I think, because of that, rather than like, oh yeah, men and women are different rather than, yeah, they are. And also they come more together because I think it's almost like, I don't know, that almost seems the root of masculinity and femininity really. You don't, you don't have one um, without the other. And if you do, you usually end up uh, running into trouble. Yeah, for me, it's um, an integral way of being men and women together is um, seeing your own conditioning. First of all, make a difference between gender roles and gender qualities, let's say, of masculine, female, feminine qualities, which are innate, which which you can see by what is inspiring you, what is what is bringing you into your your enthusiasm and things like that. Uh, 
then you see what's what's your your thing you know and and that is often different w- between men and women and that when we are in a relationship that we find a way to appreciate that in the other instead of blaming the other for being so different and wanting so different ways being attentive to choose a partner who is not completely in another level of development because that will never work and then uh, yeah be able to 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 change the roles whenever you want not say oh this is just feminine and this is just masculine role no i mean yeah i i wouldn't go and and uh, go be a truck driver that maybe not but i can drive with my car and it doesn't have to be the man drive the car or things like that you know or in the house that a man cooks and a woman does sometimes the repair stuff and things like that so that is the flexibility in the roles and no expectation that it's a fixed way of being and exploring the possibilities which we have alone as everybody supporting each other in the growth personal growth and and also coming together and exploring relationship be be authentic be 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 you know really inquiring into what is for the other person and what what has happened now between us can we talk about it and things like that so that we grow together and grow everybody by themselves with the loving respect of the other person and don't see things black and white never again <laughs> was long but <laughs> yeah well well thank you so much everyone this was this amounted to be a, a very fruitful discussion and uh, that was quite easy we just solved the gender wars in about an hour and a half so i think that uh, <laughs> we can do a great service to society by pop- popularizing these discussions so Thank you for your clarity and for your contribution and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Ryan, Heidi, Paul. Thank you. It was really great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.